and welcome to our Facebook Live with Children's Hospital of Richmond at VCU. We're here at the, on the sixth level of the Children's Pavilion where we just celebrated the building's birthday about a month ago, the first birthday of our pavilion. Um, my name is Kate Marino and I work in the marketing department here at CHOR. One of the best things that we get to do in marketing is share the news of our wonderful services and physicians here at CHOR like Dr. Jeffrey Haynes. Dr. Haynes is a professor and he's the director of our Children's Trauma Center here at CHOR. Um, and he's here with us today in recognition of National Trauma Awareness Month um, to answer our questions. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Haynes. Thank you, Kate. Um, we'll go ahead and get started, but if anybody watching has questions along the way, please comment below and um, we'll try to make sure we get all your questions answered throughout our chat today. Um, so to get started, Dr. Haynes, can you describe a little bit about your role here at the hospital? So probably easiest to understand that uh, I trade, I'm a pediatric surgeon. It's what I went through a lot of training to do. So my practice is that of surgery on children 17 years and younger, mostly. But another compartment of, and a very com uh, important component of pediatric surgery in general is caring for injured children, so pediatric trauma surgery. So a big part of my life now has been uh, as director of the Children's Trauma Center here at Shore, where we, were, where we were responsible for all aspects of care of the injured child. It's probably easiest to understand that we're responsible for if a child is injured in a car accident to taking care of them, treating everything, all their soft tissue injuries, their broken bones, things like that. But there's a whole lot going on before that happens and after that happens that's involved in our trauma center. So um, that sort of keeps me busy uh, most days of the year. Sounds like Some it. nights too, <laughs> a lot of nights too. Why did you choose to go into trauma care? So trauma care uh, is actually a later evolution. I would say that I was first attracted to uh, pediatric surgery based on the uh, embryology uh, that a lot of uh, uh, children are born with, the congenital problems. And so as I got to know pediatric surgery there and started practicing that, um, the need arose here at Children's Hospital of Richmond about six, seven years ago to more formally establish a pediatric trauma program. As you may get into, we've always been a level one trauma center since 1981 or two, but more recently we've uh, redoubled our efforts and really focused on the unique, in, in, unique needs of the injured child. And that interested me in terms of trying to develop that program, bring it out of the ground with a lot of uh, enthusiastic people that helped me do it, including the support staff as well as a lot of willing to other doctors and nurses here. So it was, a, it was a great opportunity and it's been great so far. Excellent. So you mentioned we are a level one pediatric trauma center. Can you just explain a little bit about what that means? Sure. So if you, um, a level one trauma center, well, let me back up. There are different levels of trauma centers, level one, level two, level three, but level one is the highest and indicates that you, that institution or hospital, has the highest level of preparedness and is able to deal with any injured child. So we are a pediatric trauma center specifically, and because of that, uh, we really uh, never have to transfer out any injured child. We have the resources here at Children's Hospital to care for that child and get them back to health. Great, and we're the only one in the state that is correct. At this point in time, we are the only uh, level one pediatric trauma center um, uh, designated by the Commonwealth of Virginia, the Virginia Department of Health, um, and also by the American College of Surgeons. So what makes that important? Okay. So uh, probably the organization in this country that knows more about trauma than anything else is the American College of Surgeons. And uh, because of that, they have published a, a book called Optimal Resources for the Care of the Injured Patient. It's about a 200 page book of things that you need to do to be a level one or level two or other level trauma center, but came, contained in there also the criteria to be a pediatric trauma center. So uh, what that means is uh, with those criteria all in place, uh, we have the optimal resources uh, judged by the ACS and that involves a site visit. They will come 
where they do come for about a day or so, day and a half, visit with us, look through our records, look through our performance improvement, walk through the hospital, see how it all works, and then you either pass or you don't pass in terms of do you have those optimal resources. So that's what it means. It's an, it's an external validation of things that we think we're doing very well internally, and it's always nice to have that external validation. Absolutely. Um, so obviously your team works very hard every day working with these children. What other services here at CHOR, what other specialties sort of support your team in that care? Well, I think you said it well, Kate. It is truly a team, and uh, that's a, a real privilege of my job is that I uh, am, know and can call on a host of experts in specific areas of pediatric trauma care. And while ultimately myself and my team are responsible for making sure it all goes smoothly, I'm the first to admit that I'm not the clinical expert in many of these areas, say pediatric neurosurgery. But I have a number of pediatric neurosurgeons, uh, for example, that I can call on and I rely on them for their expertise and their willingness to do so. So other areas, you can sort of think about uh, pre-hospital uh, pre care in terms of prevention, and we, we may get into that. Uh, In-hospital care is probably the easiest, un easiest to understand. I mentioned pediatric neurosurgery. Pediatric orthopedics is enormous in terms of broken bones or other soft tissue injuries. Um, ear, nose, and throat and facial injuries. Uh, we have plastic surgery, pediatric plastic surgery. I can't leave out burn surgery, looking at our, uh, looking at our poster here. Uh, the Evans Haynes Burn Center here last year admitted 125 children, and that's just the children that were burned severely enough to be admitted. It doesn't include outpatient visits. So um, those are just some of the experts that I can call on that are important parts of the Children's Trauma Center here. Excellent. Okay, let's see if we have any. No questions so far, so if you're watching, remember Dr. Haynes is our expert here and he's willing to answer any questions you may have along the way. Um, and as a reminder or um, to let you all know who may have just joined us, Dr. Haynes is the director of our Children's Trauma Center here at Children's Hospital of Richmond at VCU and he's here um, answering our questions about uh, trauma and National Trauma Awareness Week. So we'll keep going. Um, what special equipment or teams do we have here that support you as well? So we have a lot, Kate, in terms of response to the most severely injured child, which is really when you need the most resources. Um, in, in terms of teams and preparedness, we do a lot of education uh, at the EMS level, emergency medical service or rescue squad level, because while pediatric trauma can be severe, it's also, unfortunately or unfortunately, how you look at it, fairly infrequent compared to adult trauma. Uh, so when it does come, uh, when it does happen, uh, there can be some um, concern by the uh, pre-hospital providers, rescue squads, am I doing the right thing? So we uh, go to a lot of effort uh, to do pre-hospital education, offering seminars, uh, giving talks around the community statewide, uh, to try to make that a little bit better and facilitate the approach to the injured child. Um, we certainly have um, life evac, the uh, helicopter system that a lot of very seriously injured children can be flown right to our helipad. Uh, and that's just uh, goes to the time of transport and getting the most the sickest here the quickest so that we can attend to them. Um, other very, uh, very uh, specialized things, things uh, that I could think of are like ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation that we have used in drownings, uh, where we can put a cannula a, a catheter in an artery in a vein in the neck and temporarily oxygenate the patient's blood while the lungs heal and then remove the machine and save their life that way. So uh, we really have a lot of unique uh, and extensive things here as part of our level one trauma, pediatric trauma center. Um, what are some of the common traumas we see? You've mentioned a few, but what would you say are the most common ones you see here? So um, I actually know that very well because as part of the, uh, being the director, uh, I need to keep my finger on that uh, in terms of what we do and how we are doing it more importantly. But absolutely number one are motor vehicles children that are injured in car accidents. And that's pretty easy to understand. We have, gee, 
know, when's the last time you didn't drive home and see a car accident? So children are in the cars a lot of times. So that, uh, that occupies a lot of our time. Um, the second uh, number of our uh, uh, frequency I've already mentioned, that's Burns. Okay, so the Evans Haynes Burn Center stays very, very busy. They have their own verification by the American Burn Association as both an adult and pediatric trauma center. And that verification was just renewed um, two weeks ago. So that is a spectacular resource too. And the third one is uh, just by mechanism is falls. And that can be, you know, the eight year old fall fell out of a tree that he was climbing or off the jungle gym at the playground, things like that. So that's, uh, that's commonly what we see. Okay. Um, what's involved in recovery from trauma? I suppose it depends on the type, but can you just yeah. talk a little bit about that? Sure, and I, I think in terms of recovery, probably the, uh, the easiest part to understand is the uh, physical and physiologic recovery. Uh, let's say a child comes in and has, uh, was in a bad car accident has a, a mild brain injury and an abdominal injury, sure, as surgeons, we can sort of patch them back together and, and get them back to, um, back to health and doing well. Um, so that can involve um, everyone from the child's arrival to include pediatric emergency medicine, as it's a combined resuscitation in the, in the trauma room. Uh, it can involve the pediatric intensive, intensivists who are ICU doctors who do a spectacular job here supporting us. Um, it can involve the, some of the subspecialists I just said, the neurosurgeons. It can certainly involve me or my partners uh, for the abdominal or chest injuries. Uh, and then a, a host of other people, physical therapists, occupational therapists. If it's a child that's in the hospital a long time, we have school teachers. They're going to come by and make sure they do their homework to the extent that they can. We don't want them to get too far behind. We value education above all else here, just like everyone else does. Can't get out of that school work. No, you cannot. <laughs> and I see some long faces when I make rounds and some of my patients that have been here a while, but the school teacher is there and doing their work. And uh, along those lines, that's how we get an injured child home, particularly those that are here a little bit longer from it. Um, a recent emphasis of ours uh, is, is more of a holistic approach to the child. Um, and that we are now undertaking uh, screening for a longer term effect of trauma in a child. So we all know that being in a car accident can certainly be a scary thing. If you've ever been in one or anyone's ever been in, you, you can have flashbacks, dreams, things like that. Children are no different. And this can really affect their life at home, their sleeping, their, a their appetite, their, um, their performance at school. So we are undertaking programs to look at things such as, and I'll use a couple of medical terms and diagnoses, acute stress disorder, and some, most people have heard, post-traumatic stress disorder. We hear that a lot in post-war veterans, and it can happen in children too. So we have, are adding that in, and I think it's very important to do that because that is really a big part of the holistic care of the child and how we can take care of them after discharge because when they leave us, there can be ongoing effects. Okay. Interesting. I yes. think a lot of people probably don't think about the long term, you think about the life saving. But That's right. Okay, we did get a question come in, so let's see here. How can I be sure if my child has trauma, the ambulance will go to ECU instead of another facility? How is that decided? Okay, that's a good question. Um, and what we have done is um, as a level one trauma center, we have made it um, specifically known to EMS agencies what we are capable of, okay. okay? And while there are other trauma centers in the city of Richmond who stay very busy and do a terrific job, they are not pediatric trauma centers, okay? So that said, we do know that trauma care is sort of a triage system. That is, not every child who, let's say they break their wrist, has to come here. We would like them all to, that would be great, but neighborhood care is important and the ambulance driver uh, uh, makes that decision. But they do know that the most severely injured or if there's any question, they will bring them here because we, we are the only level one trauma center in, in Richmond and the surrounding areas, in okay. Virginia for that matter. Okay. That was a great question. Those so are very good Keep questions. those coming. Yeah. Finally, I will say, if you 
want your child to go to VCU to Children's Hospital of Richmond when you get in the ambulance, you tell the driver that and that's where you'll go. Okay, that's okay. a really good point. That's right. Um, how do we partner? You, we've just talked about the community, so this is a good segue. How do we partner with the community for trauma care? Yeah. Another good question. So, uh, and, and I've sort of touched on it in different um, areas, but just to refresh, I think a lot of it is education of letting the community know that we are here and here we are today. Right. Um, so that families uh, uh, who are so invested in their children know what maybe is the best in the, in the most severe situations. Uh, we do education of EMS agencies. We do education of the public. Um, I've given a number of talks just to the lay public around Richmond about topics such as why do we need a level one pediatric trauma center? What are the benefits? Why does that make Richmond maybe a better place for our children? So we've spoken about that. We also partner with the hospitals around here, again, uh, to the lines of education, to uh, letting them know what we're capable of, to providing on-phone consultation about whether that child in an emergency room in a community hospital needs to be transferred down here or whether they could be cared for there. So as pediatric surgeons, we do a lot of that as well. And then uh, finally, if they do need to be transported, we support them with transport teams, and we mentioned the helicopter, EMS agencies, all to get them here uh, safely and quickly. So there's a lot of collaboration, just making sure that it's all about the yes. children and their safety. That's exactly right. And I think that's a good word we do to try to collaborate and let everybody know that the number one thing we are interested in is the optimal treatment of the injured child and whatever that takes, advice for you in your place or having them come to see us, that's what we're all about. Um, so what tips should parents keep in mind or, or know? What would you like them to think about to try to, um, you know, make sure if there is an emergency, we certainly hope there isn't, but what tips would you give parents if they're facing an emergency yeah, with their child? Uh, so I'm a little conflicted here to answer that question. Uh, being a parent of three children who are now grown and thinking about all the things I had to do for them to keep them out of trouble when they were young versus uh, the trauma surgeon giving advice to the general lay public. Um, I would say uh, what advice would I give, particularly the younger child, you gotta watch them every second, okay? So many things that we take care of here are because the child is just not appropriately super. You just, I mean, toddlers, you can look away for three seconds and then come back and they're across the room and maybe in front of a, a set of stairs, just as an example, and then we know what happens after that. So uh, watch your children. Second, know your resources. If there is an accident, and accidents are just that, they're accidents and they're going to happen. Know your resources uh, and know who to call. Do you need 911? Do you need your pediatrician? Do you want to come down here and have us see them? So. Um, uh, vigilance. Um, I will now also go to um, motor vehicle safety. Since that is our number one cause for admission, motor vehicle accidents, accidents, make sure your children are properly secured in an automobile. And is that, a, is that an infant seat? Is it a booster seat? Is it a child seat? Or is it just a good old seat belt? Uh, there's no question that the most severe injuries we see from car accidents are from children that aren't secured that are not wearing the seat belt or not in a proper car seat. They are lifesavers. So maybe I will put that out there as well as make sure uh, it just, the rewards are innumerable if there's a car accident. Right. Sometimes, you know, people are in a rush and they think, oh, I'm just going down the street. And, um, it's yes, and we all know that, uh, you know, from the motor traffic, uh, motor vehicle databases, most accidents occur within five miles, I believe, of home. So you, and, and why is that? Well, that's, that's, where, that's where most everybody drives right. and spends their time, so it's not that big a truth. But if you think you're just going down the uh, street to the store, yes, seat belt, secure the child, whatever it takes, just do it. You won't be sorry. Good, good point. We did have another question come in, so let's see. Is there a difference between emergency room and trauma center? How is it decided what is a trauma center? Okay, it's a good question. And, and yes, there's a, there's a big difference. So um, this goes to the capability of an emergency.
emergency room. So we are an emer we have an emergency room here, but additionally we have all the resources to be a level one pediatric trauma center as well as an adult trauma center, of course. Um, how is that decided? Well, I think the hospital itself makes the decision whether or not to put those resources in place such that they will have all this particular specialist to respond to a particularly injured child. Uh, and that's why as you look around the city, there are other trauma centers, uh, but they're designated as such. So that's, that should be public knowledge. Uh, so to sum up, yes, all emergencies room can provide some care in the trauma arena, but certainly for anything more serious, that particular emergency room, depending on its capability, would either call a trauma center for advice or transfer them to a trauma center because all the special equipment, people, teams are at that trauma center that have been put into place sort of along the way I went through earlier with the American College of Surgeons criteria. Excellent. And thank you for the questions. We Great do have question. a couple more minutes, so if you have other questions that pop up, make sure you get those in. Um, so we've talked a lot about what happens in the event of a trauma. How do we work with, uh, work with our community or do work within our hospital to help with prevention and promoting childhood safety? Yes. So uh, whenever I'm asked that, I, the first thing that always comes to mind is I would love to not have to do what I do to just be a general pediatric surgeon treating appendicitis or other things that uh, children do very well. But that's not the case. Uh, that would certainly be the case if we had 100% prevention, but accidents do happen. We can decrease the incidence of those accidents, and we have a lot of those uh, efforts going on at the Children's Trauma Center. As you probably know, we are the state agency, lead agency at the State for Safe Kids Virginia, which is our main prevention arm, and we have been for years. And just like our number one cause for admission is automobile accidents, we have a very strong and long-standing car seat program here uh, in terms of community education, uh, making sure, and this even starts as a newborn, every infant that's discharged from this hospital, we check the car seat. How's the baby going home? Is the baby adequately secured? You just can't give it to the mom and she'll ride home in the front seat holding the baby. Right. Now I know I'm being dramatic and I know everybody knows that, but we want to be sure that nothing slips through the cracks. So our car seat program in terms of um, uh, preventing car accidents and making sure everyone's well, well secured is quite extensive. Um, right now there are 26 car seat technicians through the program, and yes, they have other jobs, but they are volunteers and they are specifically trained, I believe it's a two to three day course that they must go through just in knowing how a car seat works and who fits in what car seat and what method of restraint. So uh, hats off to them for their, uh, their uh, work in doing that. Uh, and that, uh, that's one of our main prevention arms. We also have a number of prevention uh, uh, um, um, efforts through the Evans Haynes Burn Center, okay. Learn Not to Burn, things like that. A lot of public ed education goes on there. And then finally, one thing I'll just mention uh, of an accident a type of accident that's totally preventable is a child shot by an unsecured weapon. Now, with not even being political about it, um, I, I think that so many of these are totally preventable. And already this year, we've had two deaths of children who, were, who found a gun that was loaded and they it would cause the end of their life. So, interestingly, just this morning, I, I read an article that was presented this week in San Francisco at the Pediatric Academic Society, who looked at all uh, injuries across gunshot wounds uh, and across uh, children in 2012. And they found that every day, 16 children are shot. 16, right? And that translates to just under 6,000 a year. Now, if you look within that group in 2012, those under 14, the vast majority of them were accidents uh, or those involving uh, an unsecured weapon that was found by the child. So this brings me full circle to saying another one of our prevention efforts is uh, gun safety okay. and giving out gun locks. Uh, we don't know how efficacious that is, but I would just implore everyone since one in three households in this country with a child in it has a weapon, has a gun, okay. one okay. in three. 
So those that do and should make that choice, please make sure that they're secure when they're unattended. And that can either be gun lock, gun safe, unloading, keeping uh, the ammunition separate. But clearly, um, with 16 children being shot a day in 2012, we can do better because it's totally preventable. Those are some really good resources and ones that I, you know, I don't know that everybody knows. I didn't yeah. know about all of this. Yeah, you, you hear that and it really gets your attention. It so does. Um, we will continue to work on that because it's a, it is a senseless and totally preventable tragedy when these kids find an unsecured gun in our home. Right. Um, we also have our experts like Dr. Haynes and other physicians and nurses throughout our system uh, write articles and contribute to blog posts. So um, head on over to chrichman.org and you can read all of that information too. A lot of good educational um, topics related to children's health. And then we do have our safety fair coming up. This is our 18th annual safety fair on June 28th. So you can check that out either on Facebook or at our website also on cafrichman.org. Let's see. And Kate, I'm happy to um, just, uh, I was going to mention the safety fair and I'm so glad you did. As you said, it is the 18th. This is a uh, annual event and I can't say enough about it because every year we have three to 400 children who arrive and they go through uh, safety stations, 10 to 12 safety stations, and we talk about gun safety, uh, learn not to burn, burn safety, uh, traffic safety, water safety, all at car safety in terms of leaving a child in a car in the summer with the windows rolled up or just even unattended. So 10 to 12 of these stations are there. We have a lot of volunteers, uh, bless their hearts, from across the hospital, and it's a, it's a really great event and goes not only to educating the child and the parent about safety, but also the providers too, about what is important to them and really generates a lot of enthusiasm. So, um, terrific event and that's, as you say, coming up. It is, and, and bike helmets too, so. <laughs> Can't forget the bike that's helmets, right. yes. So make sure you check that out. It doesn't look like we have any other questions coming in. Um, is there anything you feel like we've missed? Have we um, covered it? I think, uh, I, I, think uh, I wanna say, just uh, in recognition of the team that I'm privileged to lead, how enthusiastic they are about the Children's Trauma Center here because we really try to take care and consider everything from prevention on the front end to care of the accident that does happen uh, to uh, rehab, rehabilitation and holistic care in terms of some of the uh, PSD, uh, PTSD or ASD issues that occur. Uh, we also, and I think a lot of people know this, have a very strong child protection team. And that is essential because as we know, so many of the children we do care for uh, can't be really advocates for themselves. It is a huge problem and we have a very long-standing, well-defined team that we can get their resources to not only give us advice in the hospital about legally protecting the child, but also in a court of law if actions need to be taken to get that child into a safer place. It, it is a tough thing to say that that actually does happen, but it happens more often than we would like. Uh, there's a world of literature out there about it, but uh, I think that is something that uh, we uh, have been particularly uh, lucky to have here in terms of ad advocate, advocacy and advocating for all our injured children in the right situation, so. It's a really good point, very comprehensive services to we, make sure we, our kids are coming first. Yes, first. and we welcome anyone's input. If there are things you think we could do better or uh, address, uh, we are happy to hear from just about anybody to uh, because we are all about uh, the total care of the injured child here. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Haynes, and thank you very much for everybody who joined us this morning.